Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to Being Mindful of Psychology. Uh, very uh, excited to have you here this morning. Thanks for taking your time on a uh, Saturday morning. It's uh, certainly a beautiful Saturday morning here in Ottawa, the home of Carleton University. And I, my name is Matthew Sorley. I'm an instructor with the Department of Psychology. And I have to say that my approach to uh, these sorts of sessions might be a little bit different than many of my colleagues in large part because I did my undergraduate studies at uh, Carleton. And therefore, I have a pretty good understanding of what it's like to be you right now. Uh, this is an overwhelming process, isn't it? I mean, there, not only are you trying to decide whether university is right for you in the first place, you're trying to decide where you want to go, what your major might, might be, where you want to live. There, there are so many different considerations. This is most definitely a period of transition. And so my role really here today is to take you on a tour of the psychology program and give you an opportunity to, to meet uh, some of the people who are uh, conducting research in the labs, give you an idea of what the science of psychology is all about. And uh, then at the end, we'll have uh, an opportunity for some questions. And uh, uh, if you do have questions at, uh, towards the end of our session, then uh, you can use the conversations tab and Q and A. All right. All right, so let's get uh, let's get started. Uh, I'm very excited to talk with you about psychology, and really, psychology is the study of what makes people tick, and that's something that I think most people are curious about. And psychology seems to to resonate with most people in one way or another. But uh, the study of what makes people tick doesn't sound very uh, very uh, uh, scientific. So the actual definition of psychology is that it's the scientific study of our thoughts feelings and behaviors. And I really like this, uh, this uh, uh, comic. When I grow up, I'd like to study about people. People interest me. I'd like to go to some big university and study all about people. I see. You want to learn about people so that with your knowledge, you'll be equipped to help them. Nah, I'm just nosy. And I think people are drawn to psychology for a variety of different reasons. Some, it's simply an intellectual curiosity. They, they want to understand more about, about what makes our, our minds go around. Uh, but for other people, there's a desire to actually try to not only understand our situations and our circumstances, but to try to try to help people and try to ideally try to help them to help themselves. And most students in psychology have some interest in one of those two, or if not both of those. Uh, both of those things. So at Carleton, uh, so much of our, our uh, of the life of our department occurs in research labs, and there are different areas of focus. And so the different areas of research focus at Carleton are developmental psychology, forensic, cognitive health, personality and social psych, and also organizational psychology. So we're going to take you on a tour of these different areas and uh, let you know who some of the, the professors are who are uh, conducting their research, but then also what are the key questions that are occupying their time? Because again, psychology is a science and good science always starts with good questions. So let's jump in. Developmental psychology, very popular at Carleton, and I likely don't have to tell you that we change across the lifespan. So the psychology of a five-year-old isn't gonna be the same as a 15-year-old or a 25-year-old or a 45-year-old or a 95-year-old. Simply our relationships change, our bodies change, our, our cognitions, our thought processes change. And developmental psychologists are interested in these changes. One of our developmental psychologists, his name is Rob Copeland. And he's very interested in shyness and social anxiety in uh, children. And so uh, one of his uh, recently published books is called Quiet at School, An Educator's Guide to Shy Children. So he's trying to, to help parents and educators to try to figure out, okay, what can we do to help kids who are socially anxious ultimately realize their potential? Other developmental psychologists in our department are interested in the effects of extracurricular participation. So you're in school, uh, you join a sports team. Uh, what are some of the benefits of that psychologically, physically, emotionally, socially? How does that contribute to uh, positive youth uh, development? We also have developmental psychologists who are studying transitions. And 
Uh, anytime we're talking about a transition, we're talking about uh, an ending of a phase of life, but also a beginning. And so many of you are uh, right around the corner are going to be ending your career as uh, high school students and then moving on to whatever is next, whether it's university or college or the workforce or something completely different uh, that necessitates a, a transition. Well, what can we do to try to help people to successfully manage the transition from, say, for example, uh, high school to university? Ultimately, we want people to be functioning at their, at their best. And developmental psychologists are interested in the nature of those transitions and what can we, can we do to help? Another area of psychology that is very popular at Carleton is forensic psychology. And here we have a number of our forensic psychology uh, psychologists, not all of them, but a sampling. And forensic psychology is all about using psychology to help us to understand different elements of the legal system. So for example, Adele Fort, she studies psychopaths and particularly the assessment of psychopaths. And uh, you likely have a, an image in your mind of a, uh, of a psychopath. Uh, and she works with, uh, with them and she works with uh, those who are trying, uh, others who are trying to work with them as well. Uh, Dr. Craig Bennell, he's interested in criminal profiling. And you've likely seen a variety of different uh, 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 forensic themed uh, TV shows and they, you know, you've got a, you've got a crime and you, you call in the criminal profiler and that profiler is going to create a profile that's going to help the, uh, help the, uh, the police ultimately go off and catch the criminal. And it's all very, very dramatic and very, very romantic almost in, in some ways. Well, he's interested in whether or not criminal profiling actually works and where there are uh, uh, gaps, what can we do to try to enhance uh, the process? And ultimately we discover that criminal profiling doesn't quite work the way we see it, uh, how it is presented on television. It's not also quite as, quite as predictive, quite as accurate as, uh, uh, as those in the entertainment industry might have us believe. Joanna Pizzullo, she's our current chair and she's very interested in eyewitness testimony. Uh, so uh, our society is very much focused on what we can see, right? So you think about uh, in a criminal trial, how powerful is it when there's an eyewitness who's able to say in court, uh, you know, they can point to someone in the room and say, yes, I saw that person and here's what they were doing at the crime scene. Well, how accurate is eyewitness testimony? Well, we find out that it's not quite as accurate as uh, we might, well, well, certainly we might hope for. And in fact, it's, it's not all that difficult to influence, to manipulate eyewitnesses into to really uh, distorting what actually happened. And so Joanna Pizzullo uh, works with, uh, with a number of different groups to try to enhance the reliability of eyewitness testimony so that we're getting at accurate information, not just necessarily what people want to have happen. Ralph Seren uh, is interested in parole boards and parole boards have a have a, a very awesome responsibility, don't they? They have to make some decisions as to you know, who is going to ultimately be uh, released you know, from incarceration and will be re-entering uh, re society. Well, big stakes involved here. Well, what can we do to try to improve the accuracy of this uh, parole decision-making process? Another area of uh, psych that is popular at Carleton is cognitive psychology. And cognitive psychology is really all about uh, how we use knowledge, how we acquire it, how we problem solve it, how we attend, how we remember, how we forget, how we use language. It's really, again, all about knowledge. And without question, uh, this is critical, especially when it comes to a, a, a you know, knowledge-based uh, based economy. And so one of our developmental psychologists, actually a number of them are interested in uh, how we acquire and refine a variety of different academic skills. So for example, uh, reading and, and writing and uh, arithmetic. We also have a number of researchers who are interested in transportation and trying to make sure that uh, the information that is presented is presented in a way that facilitates uh, safety. So think about, for example, a pilot, right? You're, you're in the cockpit and you've got all kinds of different information coming at you. You 
you have digital readouts, you have dials, you have buzzers, you have lights flashing, you have you know the, the, the ambient light within the cockpit. You have all of this information coming at you. Well, how do we organize that information in a way that allows us to attend to what is truly important and not get distracted by irrelevant information? Safety is critical. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why one of the more popular stops in the Carlton Psychology Tour is the flight simulator. And that's operated by Dr. Chris Herdman of the Advanced Cognitive Engineering Lab. And so here we have a sample cockpit and you can see all the different things that are going on there. Health psychology, uh, most definitely a, a critical and dramatically expanding area, especially over the last little while. I likely don't have to tell you why. And in health psychology, we're very much just interested in illness and well-being and, and coping with the stresses of life. We are human. We are uh, facing all kinds of different uh, uh, pressures. We're facing uncertainty. We're facing conflict. We are facing all sorts of different stresses. And how we cope and how we manage those, those stresses uh, contributes directly uh, to our psychology. It contributes directly to our well-being. One of the uh, labs uh, that's part of our health psychology area is the happiness lab. And so Dr. John Zelensky is quite interested in trying to distinguish happy versus unhappy people. So what do happy people know? What are they doing? What are they saying? What are they saying to themselves, right? How are they acting and behaving in their world right? uh, versus those who are reported to be unhappy? And this is really marking, a, I think, an important shift in psychology where traditional psychology was very focused on you know, psychological disorders. And that's often what many people think of when they think of psychology. Uh, but now we're seeing an, a, more of an emphasis on positive psychology and trying to understand people who are, are happy and optimistic and creative and resilient. And what can we do to try to promote these things? Okay? So health psychology, certainly expanding. Here's Dr. Zelensky uh, offering a, uh, a, a talk at, uh, it was a, a Canada TEDx not too, uh, not too long ago. And uh, one of his more famous studies uh, focuses on our relationship with, net, with uh, nature. Now, Carlton has a, an underground tunnel network and that it's absolutely fantastic, especially when dealing with an Ottawa winter. So it's not unusual when I'm, uh, I'm teaching, say, for example, an 8.30 in the morning intro site class and the students from residence are coming to the class. It's not unusual for them to show up in house coats and bunny slippers uh, because they have walked through the underground tunnel network. Dr. Zelensky tells us, though, that, OK, hmm, maybe the tunnel is useful in terms of getting us across campus in the winter. But we're not, as human beings, we're not meant to be constantly surrounded by concrete. It's a really good idea that we put a little more green in our lives. And so uh, his research has demonstrated the importance of getting out into nature. The more time we spend in nature, it, we, we notice that our, our mood improves, our, our basic psychology, our sense of well-being uh, improves. And I think that's a very, very, certainly a very powerful lesson. I also, uh, I teach intro uh, psychology, but I also teach a course called sport and performance psychology. And that is very squarely in the health psychology area. And so uh, that course talks a lot about the uh, psychological conditions that are associated with performance excellence. So what can we do to create conditions that allow individuals to thrive, where they can ultimately take their natural abilities, combine that with effective training and ultimately perform at their best. So we talk about confidence and goal setting and using techniques such as, as imagery and, and trying to regulate our arousal and deal with, it, with imagery and rehab and so many other things. Again, all part of the health psychology area. Social psychology is uh, a, a, an area that I think resonates with, with most people, most definitely in large part because it's the study of, of how we come to influence other people and how they influence us. So it's the study of our relationships. It's the study of groups. It's the study of conflict. It's the study of leadership. It's so many more things than, than that. 
Cheryl Harris-Simchuk is one of our researchers, and she's interested in interpersonal relationships and especially introducing novelty and trying to avoid boredom. I mean, think about uh, relationships. Sometimes you can get into a bit of a rut, right? You're just kind of going through day to day and you're you know, wondering, where's the spark? What can we do to kind of get that spark back? Well, she's interested in boredom and trying to figure out, right, how do we get introduce a little bit of novelty, uh, doing some different things uh, to try to uh, uh, to try to improve the quality of the relationships. And some of her research has been focused on on COVID, right? And think about how uh, the pandemic has influenced our relationships. Think about being in. Uh, it, you know, physical distancing. Think about being isolated from friends and family members. Think about being uh, in a residence with a small number of people day after day, week after week, month after month. That has an effect on our relationships, right? Okay, so she's interested in that. Personality psychology also very focused on uh, our our uh, our personality uh, certainly focused on our traits and characteristics. So if I know a little bit about your personality, so for example, whether you're introverted or extroverted, you know, conscientious or not so conscientious, uh, open to all kinds of different experiences, or perhaps not so much. Well, personality psychologists are very interested in that and trying to determine uh, if I know a little bit about your personality, can that help me to determine whether or not you are, are going to be successful in that particular area. Okay, I see that the question has uh, come in and I'll make sure as we get towards the end of the, uh, of the presentation to go through some of the questions. I think you'll find that the talk will, will address some of these, but I'll make sure that we've got some time at the end for, uh, for a solid Q&A. Okay, Tim Pitchell one of our personality psychologists, and he's interested in procrastination. I mean, I don't know about you, but I procrastinate. Uh, university pr presidents procrastinate. Uh, well, yeah, you procrastinate. We all do. We're really good at setting lots of different goals, but we have a habit of, of not really setting goals that provide a sense of direction and enhance our, our motivation. And so sometimes we can ultimately come to to procrastinate. We'll put things off. We'll say to ourselves, you know what? I'll do that when, I, when I'm in the mood. Or we'll say to ourselves, you know what? I feel like uh, uh, I need the pressure of a last minute deadline. Uh, you probably said that one to yourself. Well, we do all kinds of different things that compromise our success and make our lives a little bit more difficult than they need to be. Tim Pitchell is interested in that. He's interested in trying to figure out what we can do uh, to try to help people to reduce that procrastination and ultimately come a little bit closer to realizing their goals. Lastly, organizational psychology at Carleton. And when you uh, uh, graduate with a degree, you're going to be headed off into the workforce. And it's really important for us to be able to use psychology to understand workplace dynamics to understand the very nature of organizations. Uh, Janet Mantler, who is our interim, interim associate dean, uh, she's very interested in working with organizations to, to try to promote health and well-being of employees. Think about it, if the well-being of employees is low, that has a direct cost for organizations because it's really expensive to try to recruit, to try to train and, and, and ultimately select individuals to try to, to retain them. Right? That is very, very time consuming, very expensive. So it's in an organization's best interest to promote well-being. Well, how do you do that? Well, Janet Mantler is interested in using the research, using evidence-based -based techniques to try to help organizations to assess the well-being of employees, but ultimately try to identify strategies that enhance that well-being. They're also interested in helping students to manage the transition from school to the workforce. So one of the courses that Janet teaches is called Career Transitions, because there are some similarities between uh, uh, academics and the world of work. Most definitely, a lot of the skills that you're acquiring and refining at university can be applied in the workforce, definitely. But the situations are still rather different. And so what, what does, this, what does this, the psychological research say about those differences and how we can be successful once we ultimately join the workforce? 
they're interested in a variety of other things, including work-life balance, right? Trying to trying to make sure that we're we're dedicating uh, enough of our psychological space and our time and our energy, not just for what we need to do at work, but for those important relationships, for for elements of our home life, so that we're ultimately more happy and successful as a whole person. All right. So that gives you an idea of the different questions and the different areas of research that are popular with uh, our departments, popular with our researchers, popular with our, our students. But I thought it'd be useful to take a look at some of the different program elements that uh, you might find useful. And so we'll start with BA and BA honors, right? And so uh, we've got uh, the BA program, which is a what's called a 15 credit program. It used to be known as a as a three year program. And we have a BA honors, which is four, which is a, a 20 credit program, or what used to be known as a four year uh, program. We also have a BSc or a Bachelor of Science uh, uh, honors program. And uh, one of the big questions that I'm asked is, what's the difference between the BA honors and the BSc honors? you take exactly the same psychology courses. There's no difference whatsoever in terms of the psych. What's different are the non-psych courses, right? So your electives and, and, and actually a number of other required courses. In the BSc, more courses have to be taken in the physical sciences. And so you'll be taking more courses in math and, and stats and, and perhaps biology and chemistry and, and neuroscience and a variety of other areas as well. So same psych, but just different uh, non-psych. Uh, courses. We also offer combined honors. So say that you decide, you know what, I love psychology and I want to major in psychology, but I also love sociology just as much. I can't decide. Well, you don't have to. You can declare a, like a combined honors uh, major. So you have two majors. Now, these majors uh, in a combined program, you have fewer electives. So there are fewer uh, you know, free courses for you to, for you to, uh, uh, to take. Um, and they're a bit more restrictive, but they work out for a great many people who really are have an equal level of interest in a couple of different areas. We also have uh, the ability to declare a minor. So you have a major, and so in psychology, roughly half of your courses in your program would be psychology courses. But with a minor, you're taking a, 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 a reduced number of courses in another area that you identified as a secondary interest. So you might decide that, okay, I'm gonna major in psychology and I'm gonna declare a minor in music, or I'm gonna have a major, a major in psychology and a minor in law. Okay, well, you, you can do that. And it's possible to declare a minor in most other disciplines within the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences and the Faculty of Public Affairs. Where it gets a bit more challenging, you, you can't be a psych major and minor in engineering or journalism or something like that. Okay. Another uh, uh, really key program element that I want to mention to you are concentrations. So we designed these just a few years ago, and they're they're extremely popular. So it is possible to declare a concentration in any one of the research areas that I've mentioned earlier. You don't have to, but you can. And then at the end of your degree, it will have your degree program. It will say on the piece of paper, you know, uh, 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 concentration in forensic psychology. Right? Uh, some students like to like to have that. When you declare a concentration, uh, you are provided with a list of courses that are consistent with that concentration, and it makes registration a little bit easier because it identifies the courses that are consistent with your areas of interest. Right, and so it helps. It gives you a bit of a roadmap to making your way through your degree program, and a lot of students really really like that. And uh, I think, from my understanding, Carlton has the most diverse array of, of uh, psychology concentrations in the country. All right, next up, we also have uh, what's known as our stream in mental health. And this is for advanced level undergrads, so a little bit later in your program. And uh, this program combines a number of different elements, but it's primarily geared towards those who are interested in a career in mental health services. And so there are some courses, so for example, on, on, on clinical interventions. Uh, are exclusive to those who are part of this stream. Uh, it's limited enrollment and, and uh, it's based on your your uh, your grades in the program. Uh, so it's fairly competitive, uh, but uh, it's certainly very, very popular. 
I, I should also mention with the stream of mental health, it's not just about taking classes. There are also opportunities to gain experience outside the classroom as well. And that, that counts uh, towards the fulfillment of the, of the stream. Uh, as we'll see, it's always great when you could be gaining some experience outside the classroom. All right, let me take you on a really quick tour of um, our, uh, our, our, the different years of the program. So what can you expect in first year? Uh, what can you expect in, uh, in second year, et cetera? What are some of those key uh, program elements? Okay. And I see there are a number of questions that are popping up uh, in the chat. I'll make sure to get to those when we get towards the end of the, uh, end of the talk. All right, so for intro psych, uh, that, this is the starting point. I mean, psychology, as you likely already have this impression, is an almost impossibly huge and diverse discipline. All right, you need a tour of that discipline so you can start making some decisions about which areas interest you the most. That's what intro psych is all about. And I teach introduction to psychology as do a number of other faculty members. So it's possible if you come to Carleton, you might be working with me in your first year. Now, just about everywhere will offer really large intro psych classes, right? It's possible to do that. Uh, and so our largest intro psych uh, class, or at least our largest classroom, has 444 seats in it. That is a big room. And for some people, that's, that's a decent learning environment. That's what they're looking for. We like to do something a little bit different for our majors. And so for our department, we offer intro psych sections for majors. And I typically teach those sections. These are smaller sections that capped at 120 students, but they also include active learning tutorials that are capped at 30 students. And so in those tutorials, you're working with your colleagues and you're doing psychology. So it's not just about trying to memorize psychology, you're working actively with the material. Let me give you an example. So in Psych 1002, uh, I'll be uh, chatting with our students about psychological disorders and treatment options. All right, we've done that. Then you head off to your tutorial and then you work with your colleagues analyzing case studies. So you'll be offering a diagnosis, you'll be uh, developing a treatment protocol, and then you'll be presenting your uh, hypothetical uh, uh, individual to the class, uh, to your tutorial, and then they'll be criticizing your ideas, right? They'll be saying, okay, well, in class, Matt said that for this particular psychopathology, uh, uh, he's saying that this technique would be most effective for individuals presenting these characteristics or these symptoms. Well, could you talk to him about why you made this choice as opposed to that choice? This is exciting academic stuff, right? You are doing psychology. And every week, there's a particular tutorial that is focused on, uh, on, the, uh, on the discipline. A little something extra we like to give to our psychology majors. So it's not available for minors or uh, majors in other disciplines. Okay, also in the first year, and this is something that uh, I know at Carleton we're really excited about, uh, first year seminars. And these aren't exclusive to psychology, right? but although there are some first year seminars that have a psychology focus. So for example, I uh, co-teach a uh, first year seminar called the Psychology of Success. And first year seminars are small classes in the first year, right? capped at 30, and you're engaged in presentations and group work and close analysis of text and lots of writing, getting to know your colleagues, working with a faculty member, right? Very much focused on the skills that are associated with success at university and beyond. It's really nice when you can be doing or be a part of that sort of environment in the first year and not just in really huge classes, right? So if you're a psych major and you're taking the majors only sections of intro, and then you're layering on a first year seminar, well, that means a healthy percentage of your first year is gonna be focused in smaller class environments. That's a really, really nice, uh, nice thing. Now, again, the first year seminars aren't all focused on psychology. Some have a psych theme, some might have a law theme, some have a sociology theme. Uh, the key really is that you're focusing on skills. Uh, the, the actual content of the course, some would say, is, is perhaps less important than, than, uh, than the skills you're acquiring and refining. All right, so in first year, you, you've had that tour of the discipline. That's great. Now you move on to second year. And one of the courses, that you, a couple of courses you have to take in research methods and stats. And I know very, very well that uh, as soon as I say statistics, a lot of people kind of lock up 
And they're like, oh no, I didn't know I was going to have to take math in psychology. Well, psychology is a scientific discipline, right? And so how a study is conducted and, and how the data is analyzed is just as important as what was ultimately discovered, right? So you need to take those courses in research methods and stats. But they're also branching courses at second year that are mo most more focused on the different research areas. So social psych, forensic psych, et cetera. By third year, you started to make some decisions about which areas of psychology truly interest you the most, and you start getting a little bit more, more focused, okay? So uh, courses in clinical psychology, that's a, a really uh, a, a healthy enrollment uh, for that one. Uh, courses in positive psychology, we've got courses in relationships, my course in sport and performance psychology, for example, there's a course in sex offenders, lots of different uh, diversity uh, in terms of these courses. And then there's also a full uh, year course called design and analysis, where you take the research methods and stats from second year, and we up the ante a little bit. There's also a, uh, an honor seminar course, which is a small class capped at 20. And uh, there you are really thinking more deeply about, about how do you design your own research study and ultimately how do you gather data, uh, how do you analyze that data, how do you write up a study, right? You're not actually doing that in the honor seminar, but you're learning a little bit more about how that process operates. And that becomes really important as we head off to fourth year because you want to cap off your undergraduate career in style. And there are two ways that you can do that at Carleton. One way is via a thesis where you're a member of a research lab working with a faculty member and their honors students and their master's students and their PhD students. And you're designing a study. You're actually you're developing an hypothesis. You're designing the study. You're gathering your data. You're analyzing it. You're writing it up. It's a very impressive uh, uh, document. And you are really bringing all the skills that you've learned across your program to bear on this particular key psychological question. Other students, though, will find that their career ambitions don't really require them to do a thesis or they're not interested in conducting their own study. Uh, so even more popular than the thesis is our project course. And so this is a course that is capped at a little over 30 students. And you, you uh, 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 determine an area of interest. So maybe it's psychopaths, right? Maybe it's positive youth development. Maybe, who knows what it happens to be, right? And your entire year is focused on researching that area. But you'll be engaged in a variety of presentations. Uh, there'll be some group work. Uh, you'll be developing a poster for a, for a little conference that I'll be telling you about in a second. You will be uh, um, uh, developing briefing notes. So you're pretending that you're in the federal government and you're developing some briefing notes for a deputy minister. So there are all kinds of really different uh, applied type uh, assignments focused on your area of choice. You get to pick what you're gonna focus on throughout the year. And that, that's pretty exciting. I mentioned that you get to present a poster of your capstone experience. That's true if you're a thesis student or a project student. We hold uh, Ontario's largest psychology undergraduate conference that we call the Psychology Undergraduate Research Event or PURE. And uh, at PURE, uh, you're putting your, you're, you're really detailing uh, what you were up to during your fourth year and you're putting together a poster and the department comes by, your colleagues come by, members of the university come by and they chat with you about, about your poster and your final year and your, your plans ahead. Uh, it's one of those events where just about everybody in the room is happy. It's a really fun event and oh yes, it's catered. Nice touch, nice touch. Last elements that I want to focus on before we uh, get into a little bit of Q and A. Really important to gain some experience. And one of the ways that you can gain experience is co-op. Another way is via the practicum. And so with co-op, you are uh, adding on a year to your program, right? So it turns what would traditionally be around four years to complete a program, although some people take a little bit more for honors, uh, and it adds that full year. And during that year, that extra year, you are working in the community, earning a full-time wage. Uh, you are engaged in fairly deep career exploration. You are networking. You're gaining all kinds of different skills that are far more difficult to gain in a classroom. And so co-op is, uh, is uh, certainly a, a, a wonderful uh, experience for the overwhelming majority of, uh, of people. 
You might decide though that I don't want to take a full add a full year onto my program. I like the idea of the cash, but I don't really want to take that extra year. Okay. Well, then you can gain experience via the practicum. And the practicum is a half credit course. So it runs for a single term, like either during the fall or the winter. And then what you get to do is you get to volunteer in the community, right? And earn course credit along the way. So uh, for a number of years, I was uh, working with our practicum students and they would be, be working in the community, volunteering. Uh, but I'd also get them to do a number of different assignments around that work. So there'd be some reflective essays they'd have to write. There'd be a poster they'd have to present to the other practicum students. And it was all very much focused on skills, like really thinking about what are the skills that I'm acquiring and refining? How does this relate to my career plan? What are my skills gaps? And what can I do to try to enhance those skills so that I'm more desirable as uh, uh, to employers? And so on and so forth, right? One of our practicum students, a couple of years ago said this, and it's always kind of stuck with me. She said, the practicum provided some exposure into the mental health field and solidified that this is the right path for me. And so some students will say that after they've done co-op or they've done the practicum, they'll say, you know what? Uh, I realized that that area isn't for me, right? I realized like I was able to test drive that field and I've decided it doesn't work, right? We test drive a car before we buy. Why wouldn't we test drive the career path? before we commit our lives to it, right? Well, co-op and practicum help us to, uh, uh, to do that. And for other students, they realize this is a perfect fit. I love this, right? This is perfect intellectually, emotionally, physically, uh, et cetera. Wide range of co-op and practicum par uh, uh, partners that we have, everything from the, the school board, the Ottawa Hospital, we've got CHEO on there, the RCMP, uh, and more. All right. That's an awful lot of information, right? Now, you likely have some questions and I'll get to some of those questions in just a sec. But uh, say after this session, you decide, you know what? I really wanna learn more about what's possible. I wanna learn more about the department. Uh, I, have a, I have a specific question uh, that wasn't dealt with today. Okay, great. Well, you can email psychology at carlton.ca. That's our undergrad office. You can visit our website, carlton.ca backslash psychology. And on that site, you'll see sample program layouts. You'll see links to the different researchers' web pages. You'll see faculty uh, videos are on there. Uh, lots of, of content that I, I recommend you take a look at just to see if, if, if the department feels like it's something that you want to be a part of. Uh, we also have our Twitter feed and Instagram, which is very much about keeping people updated about current events and what's going on in the department. So I'll just I'll leave this slide up just for a little bit, just while we take a look at some of the questions. Okay, so I'm just going to go back here. It looks like the questions around combined majors and minors uh, have been addressed. That's great. Uh, to, and also there's a question about uh, prereqs from high school. It looks like that has been addressed as well. Uh, so thank you, Carlton hosts, uh, for taking care of that. Da, da, da. More questions about uh, co-op. Yeah, co-op is uh, applicable just to uh, majors and specifically those in our BA honors program. It's not available for those in our uh, BSC, okay? Uh, when is co-op usually started? Uh, well, co-op work terms in psychology can start as early as the summer between third and fourth year, but the co-op program uh, actually has a number of uh, elements that you have to work with before that time. So there's a, a, a non-credit course called Co-op 1000, which gives you a chance to, to learn more about the job search and how to use the database of available jobs uh, so that you can find a co-op placement. Uh, there's all kinds of different work-related skills, elements that you learn in Co-op 1000, but the first work term uh, uh, for co-op uh, can either be the summer between third and fourth year or the fall of your, of your fourth year, okay? Uh, one question about what program would you recommend for someone who wants to go into clinical psychology to become a psychologist? Uh, I would recommend the psych program. Uh, and you could either do the uh, BA honors or the BSC honors. Either would be uh, perfectly appropriate for that. And then if you want to be a clinical psychologist, you would go off to a clinical program after your honors program. 
So in some cases, you would take, you do a master's and a PhD, uh, and uh, that can add, all of that together can add anywhere from four to six years uh, in order to become a clinician. Now, sometimes when people say they want to become a clinical psychologist, what they really mean is they want to be a counselor, right? They want to work directly with people in some sort of a therapeutic session uh, and, uh, a situation. And that is possible. You don't need a PhD to do that. Uh, you could go off to a master's in counseling program or a, like an MA in counseling or an MED in counseling. Uh, there are also a variety of other programs that uh, provide you with a wide range of skills to, to help you to become effective as a counselor and not necessarily going through uh, all the way for a PhD and uh, clinical psychology, okay? So possible career uh, uh, ways for a psychology graduate. Uh, certainly a wide range of different career paths because psychology is the study of people and not surprisingly, people seem to come up, uh, especially in a knowledge-based economy. Uh, with any degree program, it doesn't matter if it's psychology, it's sociology, it's law, it's environmental studies, it doesn't matter. It's all about the skills that you're acquiring and refining along the way. So, for example, a study not too long ago looked at uh, the CEOs of um, S&P 500, or maybe it was Fortune 500 uh, companies, and they noted that the top uh, uh, degree stream was a BA, uh, so which is not necessarily what one what one would think, right? Well, uh, it's really all about those skills. And so think about the courses that I was mentioning that are part of our program. So if you're a psych graduate, you have some understanding of research design and stats analysis that comes up in a variety of different uh, occupations. Uh, you have a deeper understanding of critical thinking. Uh, you have enhanced communication skills, right? And so we have individuals across the economy, a variety of different sectors. We have individuals in public service. We have individuals in private service. So for example, I, I showed you the flight simulator. Well, we have individuals who are working in the transportation sector who have a cognitive psychology background. We have people with a forensic background working at the RCMP. Uh, we have individuals with health, you get the idea, right? And so, so many different uh, possible career paths. Keep in mind, though, that for most disciplines, it's not really linear. So, you know, I'm going to major in psych to be a psychologist. Not a lot of people do that, actually. People end up in a wide range of different occupational uh, areas. But it's the same in sociology. It's the same. Like, you name it. Most disciplines are, aren't really linear. You're, you're really uh, um, uh, uh, putting a lot of pressure on yourself uh, if, uh, if you're, you're looking at it in a linear way. Yeah, yeah. I should mention that I changed my major uh, four times and, uh, and ultimately uh, ended up having, settling on a couple, of, a couple of different degrees. So it's also possible to change your mind. So don't put all the pressure on yourself today to figure out what your major is going to be and what your career path is going to be forever. Great to reflect on that now but you're not committed to it. And in fact, a very healthy percentage of students will change their major after first year. And I think I, I really like mentioning that because uh, it again, takes off uh, some, of the, some of the pressure. Okay, so some questions coming in about minors in business. It looks like those are, are being, uh, being addressed uh, as well, okay? Now, one thing that I just wanted to, to mention is uh, also, um, it's great that you're here. It's great that you're a part of this event today because you're gathering really important information. And so what I really hope is that you're, you're getting your questions answered, but you're also getting a feel for the place. Uh, so much of, of what today is about is, at least from my perspective and what I'm up to, it's not so much to try to sell you on Carlton. It's really more about trying to help you to find a spot that's right for you, right? Nobody wins if uh, Carlton does a great sell job here for you and you go to Carlton and it's not a fit, right? It has to be a fit. Right. And so whether it's university, whether it's college, whether it's the workforce, whether it's something else, whether it's Carlton, whether it's wherever else. Right. You're going to get a feel for a place. And uh, and I hope that you're getting a feel for Carlton. I also hope that if you haven't already, you get an opportunity to walk on campus. And uh, Carlton does have a, an absolutely beautiful campus, especially at this time of year. And I hope that your circumstances permit uh, at least uh, uh, walking around that, that campus. I was on campus uh, last week walking around and it's, it's hard not to feel even a little bit romantic as you're walking between the buildings and the leaves are falling and you've got the Rideau River right there and the canal on the other side. It's, uh, it's, um, you, really, you, you really are soaking up 
that, uh, that university feel. Okay. All right. Well, our host uh, suggested that we be done by uh, 9.45, so we're right on the, on the button. Uh, I'm going to be heading over to the psychology booth at uh, 10 o'clock, and I'll be there from 10 uh, to 11. So if there are any other questions, if you want to have a bit more of a smaller group type conversation, don't hesitate to head over to the psychology booth, and I'd be happy to chat in more detail with you there. Okay, now I'm just going to check to see if our host, uh, ah, yes, our host is recommending that I mention the booth. All right, we check that box. All right. Well, thank you very much for being a part of the session, and uh, I wish you all the best with the rest of your day and with your important decision-making process. Thank you very much.